Hi everyone, welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com and supported by this amazing AI study tool called Visdolia. At the end of this session, I would be providing you with the link via Visdolia for the practice session so that you can understand the topic much more better. So the topic for today's session is Hodgkin lymphoma. Particularly, we will be discussing about the etiopathogenesis of Hodgkin lymphoma. So, what is Hodgkin's lymphoma? So, by definition, these are group of lymphoid neoplasms. So, when I say lymphoid neoplasms, lymphoid meaning, you know, any tissue or cell that forms part of lymphatic system, which plays a major role in immune system or immunological function. So, Hodgkin lymphomas are group of lymphoid neoplasm, which arises in a single lymph node or chain of lymph nodes and spreads first to anatomically contiguous lymphoid tissue. So, it is categorized into two different forms. One is called classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Another is nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. The name Hodgkin for these group of lymphoid neoplasms is after Thomas Hodgkin, who was a British physician and pathologist. Way back in 1832, described a lymphoid lesion, which later known to be Hodgkin disease, and now it is known as Hodgkin lymphoma. Okay, it's no longer called Hodgkin disease. Now it's called Hodgkin lymphoma. It's more slightly more common in uh, men than women. When we look into the other aspects of uh, epidemiology when I talk about classical versus nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. So, what are all the risk factors for development of Hodgkin lymphoma? The most important one is the young adult who have had Epstein Barr virus infectious mononucleosis. It is said that they have a three fold higher risk of developing Hodgkin lymphoma. Certain HLA subtypes, particularly when the individual is having HLA B18, you know, they are known to have increased propensity to develop Hodgkin lymphoma. And it is said that it occurs often, more often in people with altered immunity or with autoimmune disease, particularly uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And very important to note that it accounts, I mean, the Hodgkin lymphoma accounts for around 7% of malignancies seen in people with ataxia and aphasia. So, what is the tumor cell or the neoplastic cell in Hodgkin lymphoma? This is known as Reed Sternberg cell, named after these two people, Dr. Dorothy Reed and Carl Sternberg. Reed was the one who described a peculiar type of giant cell in Hodgkin disease way back in 1902 during her fellowship. Sternberg, in 1898 itself, he had described these unusual cells in a lymphoid lesion, which later came to be known as Hodgkin disease. That's why when Dorothy Reed emphasized that it is a neoplastic origin and hence collectively because of the contributions of these two people, it is referred to as reed Sternberg cell. And this reed Sternberg cell is a very large cell, often more than 50 microns in diameter, which has an abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. The nucleus is often binucleated. It's like a mirror image kind of nucleus with a very prominent eosinophilic inclusion-like nucleoli. Because the nuclei often resembles that of the owl's eye, so this is referred to as owl's eye appearing nucleus of a reed Sternberg cell. Now that we know what is the tumor cell, that is a reed Sternberg cell, right? Now what is the cell of origin of these reed Sternberg cells? In the vast majority of cases, these neoplastic cells in Hodgkin's lymphoma are derivatives of germinal center B cells. Okay, it is these B cells in the germinal center which transforms itself into a reed Sternberg cell, which is a neoplastic cell. And you have to remember that the neoplastic cells in Hodgkin's lymphoma, they are not too many. Okay, they are very few neoplastic cells. But then what you see is that these neoplastic cells are seen amidst a prominent mixed inflammatory cell background within the lymph node. Okay, so you have to identify these neoplastic cells to call it as Hodgkin lymphoma. So, as we mentioned earlier, the Hodgkin's Hodgkin lymphoma is categorized into classical Hodgkin lymphoma and nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. Right. So, classical Hodgkin lymphoma is the most common one, accounting for around 95% of Hodgkin lymphomas, whereas nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma constitutes around 5% of Hodgkin lymphomas. 
Classically, this classical Hodgkin lymphoma has bimodal age distribution, which means there is one peak at 15 to 35 years of age and there is another peak in older adults. Whereas the nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma usually or mainly affects people around 30 to 50 years of age. Of course, they can occur in children, but this does not have a classical bimodal age distribution. Yeah, as I said earlier, history of uh, history of infectious mononucleosis caused by Epstein-Barr virus have a higher in, higher incidence of development of either of these lymphomas. Classical Hodgkin lymphoma has four subtypes, which includes nodular sclerosis, mixed cellularity, lymphocyte rich, as well as lymphocyte depleted Hodgkin lymphoma. See the morphological aspects of these four uh, types of classical. Hodgkin lymphoma I will discuss in the next session. As of now, let us understand in detail about the pathogenesis of Hodgkin lymphoma. So, for that we need to understand what happens in the normal, you know, B cells in the germinal center, okay. The B cells in the germinal center, normally what happens, you know, there will be immunoglobulin gene rearrangement. Because of this uh, rearrangement, the B cells are able to produce diverse range of antibodies. Okay, so this is a normal mechanism which occurs in these germinal center B cells. Now, in Hodgkin lymphoma, the same you know B cell in the germinal center, some of these cells acquire clonal immunoglobulin heavy chain rearrangements. Okay, this is abnormal. IgH. Uh, clonal IgH gene rearrangement occur along with somatic hypermutation and the cause for such you know somatic hypermutations and clonal IgH gene rearrangements is actually not really known but then once this happens the B cells gets transformed into a neoplastic cell called Reed Sternberg cell. Now, though we know that this is the Reed Sternberg cell is a derivative of B cell yet B cells lose the expression of typical B cell markers, including immunoglobulin gene marker. Okay, and it expresses other markers called CD15 and CD30, which I'll be discussing when I discuss about the morphological aspects. And the reason for it to get transformed into Reed Sternberg cell is this gene rearrangement. And the reason for loss of B cell markers is basically because of extensive epigenetic reprogramming. Now we know that. There is transformation of germinal center B cell into Reed Sternberg cell. Now, what happens to these Reed Sternberg cells? The first and the most important one is activation of the transcription factor, nuclear factor K kappa B. Now, what is the mechanism of activation of this transcription factor? Because this is an important, this has an important role to play. Let us understand the mechanism in two scenarios. One, if the cells are Epstein Barr virus positive, and two, if the RS cells are Epstein Barr virus negative, because we have seen that people who have had infection with Epstein Barr virus has increased propensity to develop Hodgkin lymphoma, right? Now, if this Reed Sternberg cell is EBV positive, you know, that expresses latent membrane protein 1, LMP1, and this is the one which transmits signals that regulate. And this upregulation leads to activation of this factor NFKB, right? Now, if the RS cells are Epstein Barr virus negative, so there is loss of function mutations in inhibitors of Kappa B or PNF alpha induced protein 3. These are basically negative regulators of nuclear factor Kappa B. And that's why there is activation of transcription factor NF Kappa B. Now, remember, after conversion of these germinal center B cells into Reed Sternberg cell, the next important step is the activation of nuclear factor kappa B, right? Now, what happens if there is activation? This nuclear factor kappa B, it translocates into the nucleus. Normally, it will be in the cytoplasm of these Reed Sternberg cells. It translocates into the nucleus and then resulting in transcription of various genes. And what are the outcomes? First one, they upregulate genes which encode the cytokines, chemokines and other molecules. It basically leads to immune response. Second, it induces the expression of lots of pro-inflammatory cytokines and that's why you have lots of inflammation in the background. And thirdly, it also promotes the expression of anti apoptotic proteins and that is very important for the Reed Sternberg cell to survive, right? 
So this is what happens when there is activation of nuclear factor kappa B. Now we need to understand what is this inflammatory response or immune response or increase in inflammatory cells. How does all this happen okay, from the reed sternberg cells? You know, there are lots of cytokines, chemokines, interleukins are produced. Let us understand this one by one. The first one is it secretes monocyte colony stimulating factor which leads to activation of macrophages. Okay, and now becomes the macrophages in the surrounding tissue becomes activated macrophage and activated macrophage you all know it has a lot of you know uh, role to play in inflammatory response. Reed Sternberg cells they also produce interleukin 13 and they also have the receptor for interleukin 13. Okay, same cell has receptor for interleukin 13 and through the autocrine or paracrine signaling autocrine meaning the interleukin 13 acts on the same cell paracrine is it acts on different cells that's all nearby cells so based on the autocrine or paracrine signaling ultimately leads to survival and growth of the rs cell itself rs cells also produce various chemokines which can result in enhanced t helper cell response basically it promotes humoral immunity rs cells secrete tumor necrosis factor and basic fibroblast growth factor resulting in fibrosis the most important cytokine which is produced is interleukin 5 which recruits lots and lots of eosinophils to the nearby environment leading on to tissue eosinophilia and we also know that there is fibrosis right the fibrosis also produces eotaxin which further increases the recruitment of eosinophils to the site remember these reed sternberg cells as i told you earlier it expresses cd30 and the ligand for cd30 is present on the eosinophils okay so there is cd30 ligand and cd30 interaction which again enhances the survival and growth of reed sternberg cells there is secretion of interleukin 10 which basically leads to suppression of T helper 1 response. On one hand, it can enhance T helper 2 response. On the other hand, because of interleukin 10, it can lead to suppressed T helper 1 response. There are other chemokines along with galactin 1, which can enhance the T regulatory cell function. And we know T regulatory cells are the ones which are very important in tolerance mechanisms self tolerance mechanisms basically it also suppresses immune responses rs cells also express cd40 the ligand for cd40 is seen on the t helper 2 cells this interaction between cd40 ligand and cd40 it triggers various signaling pathways on the reed sternberg cells which again enhances the survival and growth of reed sternberg cells okay so it also produces it also leads to production of more and more cytokines and leading on to more and more these kind of responses now there is another receptor called cmet on the rs cell which is a receptor for hepatocyte growth factor and this interaction also enhances the ability of the dendritic cells you know it activates basically the dendritic cells it enhances the ability of these dendritic cells to present antigens so thereby more and more immune response can Occur. The most important one is Reed Sternberg cells. You know, they express this PDL1 programmed death receptor ligand 1, which binds to the programmed death receptor on the cytotoxic T lymphocyte. So, once there is interaction between PDL1 and PD receptor, what really happens is that it, you know, sort of inhibits the T cell responses. And this is the mechanism of immune evasion by reed sternberg cells see by now we have seen the role of reed sternberg cells and the interplay between the various cytokines chemokines you know and all these molecules in immune response as well as in the promotion of inflammation and that's why we call this as the cross talk between reed sternberg cells and surrounding reactive cells so, all these responses leads to the morphological changes and the clinical features of Hodgkin lymphoma. So, what did we study till now? To summarize, the first and the foremost important one is the IgH gene rearrangement, immunoglobulin H gene rearrangement and somatic hypermutation in the germinal center B cells, which leads to the formation of Reed Sternberg cells. And in these Reed Sternberg cells, there is activation of nuclear factor kappa b 
and finally there is cross talk between the reed sternberg cells and the surrounding normal or reactive cells this is the pathogenetic mechanism of hodgkin lymphoma in the next session i will explain in detail about the morphological types of hodgkin lymphoma as well as the clinical features of hodgkin lymphoma now it is time for you to understand hodgkin lymphoma by active learning via fistolia just click on the link in the description below for the practice session where you can answer all the multiple choice questions and clinical scenario based questions the best part is that you do get instant feedback if you go wrong it's really fun to learn this way thank you for watching if you like the video hit the like button do comment don't forget to subscribe and please do share if you find this video useful thank you